I solve a problem every day, even on an ominous evening. This is 1143, longest common subsequence. You're given two strings, text one and text two. Return the length of the longest common subsequence. If there is no common subsequence, return zero. A subsequence of a string is a new string generated from the original string with some characters, can be none, deleted without changing relative order of the remaining characters. Now, if that doesn't make sense, essentially what a subsequence is, is you take some initial string like A, B, C, D, E, and you can decide to delete any character, possibly none of the characters from A, B, C, D, E, and the remaining characters that exist that were not eliminated is a valid subsequence. Now, of course, you have to maintain the relative order, right? So you can delete characters, maintain the relative order, print out the string, that's a valid subsequence. So you, you can also think of it as like skipping characters, right? I can choose A and I can skip C. I can uh, I can skip B, I could choose C and I can skip D and then I get to E. And this resulting string, right? A, C, E is a valid subsequence. Hopefully that is something that you understand given that this is kind of a more difficult medium problem. I'd expect that you have a strong understanding of fundamental ideas like subsequences, but it can't hurt to review that information. So a common subsequence of two strings is a subsequence that is common to both strings. So we need to find a subsequence of text one. We need to find that same subsequence in text two, and we want to return the largest subse subsequence that meets that criteria, right? So we want to find the largest subsequence, which is the subsequence of text one, and is the subsequence of text two, which is difficult, right? Because it's like, how do we do that efficiently? How do we find a subsequence of one thing and, and also find a subsequence of another thing and somehow ensure that they're the same subsequence because we want to maximize that length. So let's just go ahead and get right into the problem. So if we had um, an example such that text one equals A, B, C, D, E and text two, equ uh, let's do a different color. Let's say text two equals ACE. We know just by looking at it, right? Not that that's a, a programming approach, but we know that, you know, if we choose AC and E and AC and E here, we get the longest subsequence of length three, which is why three is returned. Um, and you'll notice that, you know, in text one, we practice the subsequence idea by eliminating B and eliminating D, and that's the resulting subsequence. Or you can think of it as we skip B to get to C, we skip D to get to E, and AC, AC, E is a uh, shared between these two systems. Of course, in text two, you skip nothing, you delete nothing, right? You choose A, you choose C, you choose E, you don't delete anything. The string itself is a valid subsequence of the string. Ah! But with that said, let's go ahead and think about how we're going to solve this using code. Well, usually when you're dealing with subsequences, it's typical that it's a dynamic programming problem, right? Because you're dealing with the idea of using a character and what the best state is you can use using a character and that might be based on previous characters that you can access right now with the subsequence for any letter you can decide to use it or skip it okay so i don't really know where i'm going with this yet in terms of explaining it but you know i had text a b c d and e right if i'm dealing with the subsequence I can either use the character or I can decide to skip the character, right? Um, so like with A, B, C, D, E and A, C, E, you know, if I want to use the character, if I want to skip the character, how would I articulate that idea? If I had this system with just A, B, C, D, E, You know, to skip a character would mean what? And to use a character would mean what? Um, well, you could think of it as like these, this being nodes. And then you have all these paths where you can determine if you want to skip a character. But what would that mean relative to A, B, C, D, and E, and A, C, E? So I'm, I'm kind of thinking circular here, but at least I'm thinking out loud about how I would go approach this problem to find a solution. You know, if a character isn't skipped, you're using it in both strings, right? Because in order for the subsequence to exist, the character has to exist in both strings, 
right? So in order for the subsequence ACE to exist, A has to exist in text one, C has to exist in text one, and E has to exist in text one because they all exist in text two. Um, I guess the idea is, is we thought about this system as kind of like all possible states you could be in, right? All possible places that you can make a combination. And what I mean by that is if you just kind of take these systems, A, B, C, D, and E, and you copied it three times. Now, what I'm doing might not make sense instantly, but hopefully in a moment, you'll see what I'm trying to articulate. You, uh, A, C, E. A, C, E. And this is the most difficult part of this problem is thinking about how you're going to model it so that you can use something like dynamic programming. And the idea that you kind of get to and how I got here is, well, you know, we're dealing with both of these strings and we have to think about like entangling both of these strings because we have to find the largest substring that exists within it, right? That's woven within this system together. So let's, let's take the system and let's kind of smash it together into this state where we think about all possible states as combinations of things that could exist and then figure out if we can find that longest subsequent that's woven within it, okay? So now I have this system where I think about every letter and its combination with every other letter in the other string, right? So if I wanted to include AA, it's here, you know, and our CC is here and our EE is here. Now, the way that this is gonna work is, well, if I don't wanna use a character of text one, I'll go down, right? Because if I go down, that means that I don't decide to use A and I decide to use B, right? If I don't wanna use B, I'll go down. If I don't wanna use C, I'll go down. If I don't wanna use D, I'll go down. So it's basically like I have these two pointers, right? Where I'm like, I'm looking at A and I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you know what? I don't wanna use A and A, so I'm gonna move my a over to B. Okay. So I can do that for each state. You know, if I'm at, if I'm looking at the C in text two, I can decide not to use an A, not to use a B, not to use a D. And so I can do that in all these states, but I can also decide that I don't want to use text two, a character of text two. So I can move over this way. Okay, so this is basically saying is like, okay, I'm at AA. Well, I don't want my final subsequence to have AA. So maybe I don't want to use text two's A and I go to AC. And then maybe I decide, okay, I don't want to use um, the blue text A and I want to start my substring somewhere else. So BC. So now I'm having, I'm painting out the states of all possible placements of the characters that you're looking at, right? Because you'll notice all possible placements are there, right? If I'm looking at, a substring that has D and C, well, then that state is where? D and C here. So all possible states are now captured within the system. And I can also think about all possible states where I don't include a character, right? So if I wanted to find a subsequence of length one, where does that exist? Well, that exists at AA and CC and EE. E. So what we might try to think about is, well, you know, if I decide to use, if I decide to skip a character from text one and text two simultaneous, simultaneously, that would correspond to a link here, right? If I decided that I wanted to skip a text one character and a text two character, that corresponds to this link here right? Because I'm going down and I'm going to the right. So I'm using a character in text one and I'm using a character in text two, right? But if I decide to use such a character, there's going to be one here as well. I guess the way that this works is there's going to be these final links here to determine the end goal. If I skip a character a and A. If I skip a character in text one and a character in text two, and they're the same, that means I get a point. Right? I get a point from doing that. 
because they're the same character. So that would increase the length of my longest common subsequence, right? If I try to create a subsequence and I just skip B, well, I'm not comparing it to anything. But if I try to create a subsequence where I skip a character in, in text one and I skip a character in text two and they're the same character, well, if I skip them both at the same time and they're the same, that must mean that I add one to my subsequence because I can include that in the subsequence that I'm finding. So now I'm kind of wovening in the subsequence that I'm looking for, right? If I skip C and C, I get one. If I skip E and E and I get one. So now you'll notice, well, the path really is as well. I'll include AA and I'll skip, so which means that I'm including the A in both text one and text two. Now I'm here. I'll skip B. I'll include C. I'll skip D and I'll include E. So what this corresponds to is I'm using, I'm using a and a this means i'm skipping b i'm using c and c right i'm using c and c because i'm using diagonal even though i'm skipping them both since i'm skipping them both at the same time that corresponds to me using them right i'm skipping d which is this link here and I'm using E and E, right? So you can see how this kind of captures that idea of skipping characters or deleting them, right? I'm skipping the character if I'm going vertically or horizontally, right? And I'm using the character in each of the corresponding spots if I'm going diagonally, which is why we have all possible states, right? Because we want to think about all possible spots, all possible character combinations that we could look at to determine a path. So then if we look at this system, right, and obviously all of these nodes have horizontals, but if they're not equal, you're skipping both of them simultaneously, but you would never use those states. So then this just becomes the dynamic programming graph, the DAG, uh, directed acyllic graph that we're going to utilize to solve this problem, right? We just need to look at all possible combinations. And then based on the previous state, we could say, well, the best thing we could get for any state like here Right, the best thing we could get here is the maximum of what we could get above, what we could get diagonally, and what we could get from the left. And if the diagonal value is equal, then we would add one. Now, one thing I'll note, so then I, that just basically means that you know our dynamic programming array for i, j, we'll call it uh, text one and text two equals well the maximum uh let's put this let's reorient the stuff so there's a little room what the hell that was weird all right all right Ugh. so i'm trying to make this so it's all in the right nice spot okay so for any spot T1, T2, so text one slot and text two slot. So like here, it's the maximum of, well, we can choose to skip a character in text one. So we can choose to skip a character in text one. So whatever that optimal solution is, we can choose to skip a character in text two, right? Cause this corresponds to skipping a character in text two. Or we can choose to use the diagonal, and if these characters are equivalent, we can add that into our solution, right? So we can say D of T1 minus 1 and T2 minus 1 plus 1 if these things are equal, right? So this is plus 1 if, you know text one at i minus one equals text two at j minus one i'm not going to write that whole thing out but you see what i'm saying so this is plus one if these things are equal right or it's plus zero if they're not 
And that way you can traverse through the whole system looking at each combination. And at the end, you just return um, the maximum uh, value you could get from the system. So with that said, let's go ahead and get right into it. Okay. So we'll set um, D equaling to a default dict with lambda value zero. Now you'll notice here that all of these values are just going to be zero. And all of these values are just going to be zero. And we have to look at the ending value. So our system's kind of shifted. We only look from like this point forward, right? Because there's only things to calculate for these values, right? These are all zeros. These are all zeros and these are all zeros. So we don't need to look at um, these values. We just know that they're zero. So we just need to look at this, these values going forward and then calculate these values down here. Okay. So we're going to look at for T1 in range 1 to length of text 1 plus 1, right? Because we want to figure out at the end, right, what the values are of the system. If we use EE, then we'd be in this state down here. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And then we do for T2 in range 1 to length of text 2 plus 1. And then we'd say, well, okay, D of T1 at T2. So at this combination, what can we do? Well, we can either decide to skip T1. We can decide to skip a character in T2. Or we can decide... To if the characters are equal at the previous string, so t1 minus 1 equals text 2, t2 minus 1. So if they're equal, we'll get an extra point plus whatever our score is at that point there. And then at the end, we just return whatever the max is we can get for any value. All right. All right, cool. So really slow, why? So the, the solution is optimal in terms of its time complexity, but there's a space complexity constraint which is making this a little bit slower. And that is, well, when we look at this system, for any node, right, like if, we can make this a little bit more efficient by doing what? Well, what we could do is if we solve all of this, then we solve all of this and solve all of this and solve all of this and solve this. If we solve it in that order, you'll notice that like I only need information from the previous row to solve the current row. Right, because for any value, it's only based on these three things. So I don't need, if I'm solving this row, I only need this row. All the information at these rows become irrelevant. So I don't need to be holding on to that information, right? It's just adding additional information in terms of space, but I don't actually need it to solve it, right? To solve EE, I just need this information, this information, and this information. So the basic idea is you can... Uh, further optimize your space complexity by just thinking about the fact that you don't need all the previous information. So if instead what you can do is this idea that I've constantly done in, in problems that I've solved prior, which is, you know, just call this D, call this new thing DD, and then when you're done, set D to DD. So what you'll do is you'll call this thing D, you'll call this thing DD, you'll finish this whole line, and then you'll call this thing D, and solve for your new DD. DD, 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 okay? So then in terms of what is what, if you have your new DD, well then DD here, D is here, and DD is here. T minus one would be on the previous row, so that would be D, but the previous column is in DD. So this would become DD, right? I'm trying to determine like for some generic level here, if I'm trying to solve CE, right? Oh, I'm looking at, 
If I'm trying to solve EC here, right? Well, T minus 1, T minus 2, right? That's in this previous column. So since it's in the previous column, it would reference D. But the previous, the previous row would reference D. If I'm trying to look at the previous column, I apologize, DD, it's in the same column. It's in the same row. Why do I keep messing that up? Okay, so if I want to solve DD for T1, T2, well, I need to figure out if I'm referencing the previous thing or the current thing. So if I'm looking at the previous T1 value, that's found in the previous row. So then I need to reference D. If I'm looking for the T... If I skip the T2 value, well, that's in the same row in a previous column, but the previous column is in DD, right? Versus this thing is in the previous row and the previous column, so it's up here in this spot, right? This is in this slot here, so that's in D. This is in this slot here, which is in DD. So that was a really confusing way to just state that. You know, we have to think about these combinations of DD and D and D, that, that. All right. So for each thing, we'll set DD to be a default dict as well, lambda zero. And then we'll update DD equaling to, if it's the previous row, it's D. If it's the previous column, it's DD. This is in the previous row, so it's D. And then at the end, we just swap. We say D equals DD. And now, this only scales with one axis versus taking total amount of space. All right, cool. So what is the time and space? Now, technically, this might be a little bit slower because I'm using default dicks, but it's just easier to use default dicks because you don't have to think about like out of bounds errors and stuff like that. All right. So what is the time and space complexity? So let's say that uh, N equals the length of text one. And let's say M equals the length of text two. Um, for time... We create this default dict that's constant. We have to look at all n characters in text one. So we look at all n characters. We create something that's constant. And then for all n characters, we have to look at all m characters. And then for all m characters, we do something constant. So for all n characters, we do m constant things. So that takes big O of nm. And then this just looks at the maximum of d values. Um, and then that'll just be uh, M, or would be M or N. We're populating T1, T minus 2. It'll be N values. Okay, so that's not important. All right, because the time is going to be shadowed by this NM constraint. All right, and in terms of space... Well, we create this default dict, right? Um, we create a copy of that. We create the same default dict, same space. And then we look at all T2 values. We update it. So that's M values here, right? Because there's M updates that we do to DD here, right? Those are the only times we actually populate something directly. Right, so we do M populations because we populate it with MT2 values, right? And then we set D to that. So then we just keep creating something of size M, we delete it. We say something size M, we delete it, and so on and so forth. So we only use M space versus before we added this DDD idea, we had to use NM space, which is why our time and space complexity improves so much in terms of the auto graders understanding. Okay, guys, that's uh, that's about it for me today. Hopefully that makes sense. I attempted to make this video multiple times because it's a pretty confusing idea and it kind of takes a leap of faith of understanding how you're going to model the problem. That way it becomes easily solvable. 